Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Um, apologies for the delay in starting, um, but we had some, some minor technical issues, which we've now hopefully overcome. Um, welcome to this, which is the third of our RTPI events held in association with Scottish Government, trying to look at national practice and to help inform what the national planning framework should look like in its next iteration in NPF4. We already had discussions and uh, presentations around um, Finland and climate change targets. We had one this morning in Australia and on livability, particularly focusing on Melbourne. And today we're going to Ireland, just a hop, a hop across the Irish Sea. And, and I'm delighted to be joined by a good friend of mine, uh, Conor Norton, Dr. Conor Norton, who is the head of School uh, Environment, Environment and Planning at Technological University in Dublin. Um, we're delighted you've joined us. Um, Conor's going to give us a, a presentation for about half an hour or so um, on the Irish National Planning Framework um, and um, as part of that um, there will be some opportunities for you to pose some questions, to make some comments, to put forward some ideas as well and if you have on your tab there is a, a, a questions uh, a button you can use or well, there's a chat function I will be keeping an eye on them so please feel free to put them through throughout the presentation and, and, and I can um, put that into the conversation at the um, once Connor's um, given his presentation. So a bit about Connor, as I've said already, he is the head of the School of Environment and Planning at Technological University Dublin, um, former chair of RTPI Ireland, who had the great privilege to work alongside him, current president of the Irish Planning Institute, um, and I know Connor has studied in Edinburgh um, earlier uh, in his career as well. So and I know he keeps a keen eye on what's going on in Scotland. So um, that gives us a really useful perspective on, on taking things forward. So um, I'm going to shut up. Um, Connor's going to give his presentation. Um, and then, as I say, if you can think about questions, comments, and ideas, put them into the questions box, and we'll have a bit of a discussion at the end of things. So, Connor, the stage is yours, as you say. Okay, Craig, um, you can, if you can hear me all right, I hope you can. Um, apologies for the delay, uh, folks. Um, it's actually not the RTPI's fault, it's mine. It's my hardware and permissions and all of that sort of stuff. So no blame attached to the RTPI, it's, it's simply me. So um, hello from Dublin, um, it's a nice day here. Uh, hoping the weather is good over there for you guys as well. Um, so uh, Craig has given a bit of a background, and I suppose I've um, had the privilege of working with Craig, and we're, I'd say we're, we're friends as well as, as colleagues. And of course, I'm, uh, I studied in, in Edinburgh um, for a couple of years, and um, you know, I'm obviously keep an eye on things in Scotland, go back on a, a regular basis. But I'm not an expert on Scottish planning, and I've been asked really, I suppose, to give an overview of uh, the national planning framework in Ireland and some of my, maybe some of my insights. I do some work with the government at, at, at different levels um, and I'm involved in parts of, of the, the planning framework. But let me, because I've lost these few minutes on you, I'm not going to wander around my presentation and I'm just going to go into the next slide, please. Okay, so I think it's important just to set out some context for Ireland because obviously Scotland and Ireland, there's a, we have a lot of similarities, but there, there are some things that are, are quite different. Um, obviously, uh, we, we all know and we, and we all agree that um, you know, national and indeed sub-national planning is an essential component of a mature planning system. We know that, so national and regional planning, both of those sort of go together. Many of the issues in national planning are indeed around how regional planning is approached in, in, the, in the territory. In Ireland, we have some specific context that's important. And, and one of those is, is, is very significant projected growth, one million of additional population by 2040, which is a staggering figure for a country of about 4.78 million. Some estimates it's about 4.9 at the moment, excluding Northern Ireland. And that will require around about 550,000 new homes, 660,000 new jobs uh, over that period. So that's a staggering, uh, it's a staggering ask uh, from planning and development, if you like, over that period. We also have significant problems that are legacy problems relating perhaps to the environment, the sort of pattern of development that has been underway in Ireland since the 1960s, 70s, etc. We've all with suburbanization, sprawl, those sort of things. We are making some progress in, in compact urban growth, but we still have those legacy issues. And there's a legacy of underinvestment 
uh, in public transport as well. So there's a lot of things we need to catch up with in terms of transport infrastructure and the like. And of course, there is that, that, that issue for us around climate change, issues around biodiversity, moving towards carbon neutrality. And we have a major uh, new policy document, the Climate Action Policy and Plan of 19, uh, 2019, which in a way um, underpins the importance of planning and national spatial planning uh, in achieving um, as, as a key plank of climate action policy in Ireland. Next, please. So the background, I think, is important as well. Um, it's, I would say, even though you know it's 50 odd years ago, that our uh, planning is pretty new to Ireland. Uh, the first uh, planning uh, legislation was 1963, and it was based. It was very simple and, and limited legislation based around local authorities with some level of oversight from the centre, the department, and the minister, etc. And it was driven really by a concern about economic development. Unlike the UK, it wasn't around post-war reconstruction or those sort of things. It was it was around a new economic agenda opening up the economy in Ireland etc so a different a different push and origin and some would argue that you know it, it was a system that was introduced not uh, by the bureaucrats the technocrats and not necessarily by by public demand and um, so we've always had that issue in Ireland um, about buy-in to the whole idea of planning and planning legislation etc so it was overhauled in 2000 and it included a lot more of the local functions regional plan making processes and the like and, and more functions at, at the national level. Next slide, please. So here's our basic structure, very similar to the UK and Scotland. We really only have two tiers of government. We've got local government and we have national government. And in the middle, we have it, what I would call administrative governance, which is the regional, which are the regional assemblies, of which we have three. But they're not directly elected, so they're not a formal tier of government. But for planning purposes, they're part of the governance structure in Ireland. Next slide. So I, I think it's also important to consider the actors that we have. We have a, a unique system in some ways in that we have um, a, the uh, development management, if you like, is an executive function in Ireland. So those decisions in development management, planning applications, et cetera, they're made by uh, the recommendation of professionals to the chief executive of local authorities. And we have a body uh, called on board Planola, which is the Planning Appeals Board, uh, which was set up in 1977. It's an independent board, which allows for appeals and reviews. And it's an open third party uh, process. Some changes of function have occurred in recent years. Uh, for example, uh, some strategic uh, infrastructure applications go straight to on board Planola. And it, more recently, strategic housing developments uh, go of over 100 houses over the last three to four years now, three years, have been going uh, directly to on board Planola. And this is quite contentious uh, for planners and the planning system in Ireland. There's another new body, um, the Office of the Planning Regulator. And, and essentially, that's a, a plan oversight and review body. Uh, and also looks at the processes um, around plan making in, in Ireland and also has a function in relation to some research and, and um, engagement in, in planning. So an interesting new body finding its feet. And um, I suppose that was to, to, to try to get more, um, to try and address what were uh, concerns about corruption. There was a, a trial, a, a, a tribunal in Ireland called the Mahan Tribunal some years ago, and one of the recommendations was really to get much greater oversight on the sort of zoning decisions, etc., that were being made at local level. So the OPR, the Office of the Planning Regulator, is very important, and the planning regulator looks at the monitors the progress of the national planning framework and the regional spatial strategies, um, uh, and the development plans. So the new land development agency um, is still under construction, really. We're waiting to see what the new board will be like. Um, is a, a new agency which is, is set up to manage and develop initially publicly owned land. Um, so that would be any state, emanation of the state that owns land would come under the remit of the land development agency. And we're expecting, or certainly planners would expect, that that role would extend to try and unlock some of the strategic lands that are held uh, just as investments around you know, points of high access, etc. Um, next slide, please. Uh, Lisa, if you can 
pop on. Yeah, great. Okay, so a little bit of uh, uh, early national and sub-national planning in Ireland. This is just uh, to bring it to just to tell you, it's not a new exercise, but it's not and it's not entirely successful one either. The first concerns about regional planning were, were very early in, in, in the 60s as well. And uh, the Buchanan report was 1968. And it did look at this sort of balanced regional development of national capital it was identified, obviously, as Dublin. But we could see that there were national growth centres also and some regional growth centres, uh, smaller regional growth centres identified in the Republic of Ireland. But it was never adopted. There was no framework indeed in a legislative sense to, to adopt or, or translate it into planning policy, but it made its way in some ways into industrial policy in the 1970s. But it was weakened again by political decision making and you know industrial development was just spread pretty much evenly across the country with very little regard to um very little regard to, to spatial planning. Uh, so it wasn't a success and, and uh, it was something that really was the interest of people who were interested in planning and academics and the like, but um, it, it, it was never implemented. But remarkable similarities uh, with what's being proposed at the moment. So next slide, please, Lisa. So the National Spatial Strategy was uh, the first real um, spatial uh, strategy for Ireland and that was um, that came from that overhaul of the legislation in, in, in 2000. Very ambitious strategy actually and it was based on the concept of sustainable development and balanced regional development. We had eight regional areas were identified and, and cooperation with Northern Ireland was of course part of that in so far as it could be. Uh, it set out broad regional structures for those eight areas and it prioritised uh, development into gateways and hubs and a few smaller urban centres. But there was a lot of policies in there that were very useful for the lower level regional planning guidelines for these eight regional areas and the lower level local area plans. Lisa. Okay. It failed and uh, you know, really there was a few reasons behind this. There was very little political buy into it. It was seen as the emanation really of one ministry or department um, and it was undermined by national policy at the very outset. A, a major um, a decentralization program was announced as part of, believe it or not, the budget in 2003 and it had little or no regard to the national spatial strategy. So effectively um, it was there uh, but the state wasn't even going to observe it in its own investment priorities in terms of decentralizing the public services across the country. So the other issue I think with it was a lot of the regional planning guidelines that were out there were already adopted um, and a lot of the local plans, county development plans were adopted and they were in situ, they were in place when the um, NSS uh, was published. So everything was a little bit out of sync. Uh, and that was certainly a, a, a big criticism. The other was, the other one was that look, Ireland's a small country. There's too many of these regions and hubs. Um, next slide, Lisa, please. So it wasn't a success, and I, I think the, the reason I mention it and and reference the NSS is that essentially it did set up that framework for national spatial planning. Um, and it, the successor to that is the NPF in 2018. And the development of the NPF started back in 2015, at the very, very start of the recovery from this recession. Uh, and it was um, a, a three-year uh, process and an advisory board, different ministries and sectors involved in it. Um, and I think it was also an acceptance. And we were very relieved, I can say, in Ireland that uh, it, planning wasn't necessarily what gave rise to the recession and it, there was an acceptance that maybe we needed to do planning a little bit better, in fact, rather than scrap it as a system that failed. Um, and also there was, I suppose, the benefit of looking at what were, was the failure, uh, or what were the failures of the NSS. But one of the important things I think is that it is an all of government planning framework. In other words, the document while prepared primarily by the Department of Housing Planning and Local Government and the predecessors to that essentially our planning and environment and local government ministry, uh, it was an all of government uh, document um, and it avoided that narrow ownership um, problem of the NSS. But I think importantly as well, um, it was realised as part of a criticism of the NSS 
was that, um, you know, the NSS was not connected to strategic spending. We have national development plans that are published every 10 years, which set out essentially the framework for public spending over that period. It also brings in some matching expenditure from different sectors as well, but it is essentially the spending roadmap and that wasn't connected. So a new framework called Project 2040 was set up and was built around 10 national strategic outcomes, which are essentially strategic uh, sustainable development outcomes. So that connection between a planning framework and a, a spending framework, if you like, is critical to, to Project 2040. That's what Project 2040 uh, really is. And that in, ties up spending to 2027, even though Project 2040 was on for another 13 years beyond that. Next slide, please. Okay, so you know, I don't need to dwell on this. You probably have seen this, I don't know how many dozen times already, but if we don't, if we don't put it up, um, you know, we could get into trouble. Uh, essentially, the, um, the sustainable development goals, etc., all of them in one way or the other intersect with plan making. Obviously, our eye is drawn to number 11, maybe uh, sustainable cities and communities, but there's a lot across the whole of those goals. Next slide, please. So we can see the national planning framework, we've got these national strategic outcomes, they're the larger, longer term outcomes which are there, you will have a look at them in, in more detail. And then you can see the connection there to the strategic investment priorities, that's the strategic investment priorities of the national development plan. Next slide. A little more detail, compact growth is there, which is uh, a critical piece of the, of the picture. Uh, regional accessibility, rural economies, sustainable mobility, and there's really everything that's, that, that, that you would expect uh, emanating from the ideas and the principles of sustainable development, sustainable cities, etc. Next slide. Okay, these are the matching investment priorities in the National Development Plan. So we obviously have a road network, we've got a public transport network, housing, sustainable urban development are huge issues in Ireland. We have a, we have a, a very significant housing uh, problem, housing deficit, our, our, our sector is finding it extremely difficult to catch up with, with demand uh, and there's been historically low, development, low investment in social and affordable housing. That is um, a deficit that's going to take a long time to reverse but there's a new programme for government which is going to move back in, in, in that sort of direction. So a lot of things there, water infrastructure, there's a lot of things to be done in Ireland, I suppose it's the same in Scotland as well. So next slide please. Okay, so some of the other elements there, I've mentioned the sustainable development goals, um, these five key cities and five regional centres, so you could say that the, the priority really is around the five cities, That's, that includes Dublin, um, but there are five cities, so very similar in some ways to the way perhaps Buchanan and even the NSS uh, envisaged um, balanced regional development, building around cities um, and uh, these larger cities where there is some hope of getting critical mass together and then supported again by these regional centres which are of uh, lesser scale and importance to that. Limits on greenfield development, 40% um, of all development to be in existing built up areas. Now there's room, you know, this is not spread equally and there is a, a range of between 30 and 50%, 50% in the case of Dublin metropolitan area. Big challenge um, and, and, and a big challenge in the development sector as well, starting to move more towards brownfield refurbishment, um, dealing with obsolete um, land sites, all that sort of stuff. So the, uh, I've mentioned, of course, um, the NDP and the connection with the NDP, but I suppose to update you on that, obviously with the pandemic, and I, it, was a, it was only a matter of time before I mentioned COVID-19 and, and the pandemic, but um, obviously there's been a significant review uh, underway of the National Development Plan and the spending priorities given the, the pandemic and, and the sort of um, problems that it's, it's having in relation to uh, planning and development. Um, but I suppose the, the positive thing there to report is that there's a new programme for government. We have a coalition government. We have had coalition governments in Ireland for the last uh, 15, 20 years, but uh, this government is basically the two central parties that were arch enemies for, well, we're not sure for what reason, but it goes back maybe 100 years to a civil war. Um, 
And then we have the Greens, uh, who have had a very strong impact, I think, in the programme for government. But the upshot of it all is that um, there's, going, there's an increased spending in uh, public transport, um, a town centre first uh, principle in the programme for government this is. So this is a political manifesto, very, very positive from a planning point of view, but we really have to see how it's going to um, drip down into you know, planning policy. And then there was a, a package, a, a stimulus package in July, I suppose, that shouldn't be forgotten, which put a lot of uh, emphasis, about two to 300 million into uh, local mobility measures and um, town centre improvement measures. Again, very slow um, in terms of getting these things done on the ground, but I think positive things for planning. So that's on the financial side of that. And something I shouldn't forget, of course, um, and uh, I know Scotland's ahead in this, um, but the, we have a draft um, marine planning framework. Um, I'm, I'm on that advisory board as well. Um, and we've been working on that the last couple of years, but we've a draft uh, now, and, and certainly the approach in Scotland and other countries across Europe was very, very useful in, in terms of looking at the framework and structures of that within the European directive uh, requirements. So there's a strong integration, and we made sure of that in the NPF, we made strong representations that the marine and the terrestrial planning would be very closely integrated. Next slide, Lisa. Okay, so an analysis uh, carried out by the department itself in 2018, uh, I think is, is, is interesting, and some of it I, I've spoken to the department, and it, it, many of these things remain the case. Dublin is, is, is very much uh, the, the primary uh, settlement in the country and it has a huge, huge um, gravitational pull, if you like, on development and, and, and settlement. So it's a really, really big problem to try and reverse that sort of trend. Unchecked, it, it, undoubtedly the city would continue uh, to grow um, uh, and uh, in, in proportion to the rest of, uh, the, rest of, of, of the country. So this is going to be a major task. And, and uh, so the investment, um, it, it's going to take a full effort in terms of investment, all public investment, and then to try and funnel private investment, to try and in some way influence that very, very strong investment trend. So the other issue is that the regions uh, and other cities, they're, they're relatively small in Ireland and um, they're not really of scale and they would need to develop and they, are, they would need the infrastructure to develop. So there's a lot of work to be done for cities the likes of um, Limerick and Cork, for example, in particular, in terms of building up their infrastructure so they can actually act as some sort of a counterbalance to the development of the city. And there are issues, of course, uh, with the settlement pattern that I've mentioned. We do deal with, with issues of sprawl and, and um, uh, urban quality, and they're, they're very big issues, I think, for us in Ireland. And there's other big externalities. There's peripherality. There's that word. I, I, I'm sorry, folks, but Brexit is is really a, a big one for us as well. Um, and generally, our, our position, uh, our geopolitical position in the European context, and, and what's happening next door. Uh, and I suppose uh, one of the other issues is there's a major um, hope, if you like, that some of the the four there's four or five funds that are there that with it, that they can be used as sort of catalysts for this balanced region development and one of them uh, well there's two of them there are these there's the urban regeneration and development fund and the rural regeneration and development fund there's one billion in the rural and there's two billion in the urban but the rural one is really about small towns and villages towns of below 10,000 population and the urban is for settlements um, that are larger than that okay next slide please i'm trying to keep to time here Okay, there's just, a, I suppose, a graphic. And the National Planning Framework uh, surprised some planners that this is the only uh, spatial graphic that's contained in the document. And um, uh, so a lot of people were concerned that maybe it wasn't, um, it really didn't clarify corridors and zones in, at the national level. Um, but it was a highly political document and it was a document going to the cabinet for the first time. So uh, maybe the officials might have thought that it was wise um, to try and get it over the line and to work on written policies and strategies and um, uh, not to be too um, descriptive around the spatial context. As a result, of course, a lot of emphasis is now placed on the regional spatial and economic strategies for each of these regions that you see, with the exception, of course, of Northern Ireland, which does have its own strategy 
2035, and there's a certain linkage to that as well. Next slide, please. Okay, so I think one of the things that did happen, and uh, you know, um, was the rationalisation of the regional structures in, in Ireland. Um, we used to have eight, and that was what was in place for the national, um, uh, the national spatial strategy in 2002. And these were called regional authorities, uh, and they were set up in 1994. Um, um, but there was a feeling that, that that you know maybe they were overly complex and um, maybe too small in terms of their of their size and scale, etc. But maybe there was also uh, maybe there was an administrative reason to cut them back just a little bit. And now the argument is that we're down to three regional assemblies. That's a new title uh, since 2015. And some people are arguing that these are just too big to be reflective of the realities of the regional structures, etc. Of, of Ireland. But look, it's that's the structure now. Each of these areas that you see. Uh, is an assembly, has an assembly, but it, these are not uh, directly elected entities. They are, I would call them, administrative constructs um, and a part of the governance system for planning, but their functions are not extensive in planning either. Um, and uh, they comprise uh, elected members from local authorities. So in other words, uh, the, the elected members in the assemblies are, are voted in on a local basis, but they have a, a regional remit when uh, uh, co-opted, if you like, or nominated for these assemblies. Okay, next slide. Okay, um, within the assemblies then, there are smaller administrative planning areas for data collection and, and the like, so that you would find, for example, that in the case of Dublin, the metropolitan area does have, um, there's administrative structures for the metropolitan area. Obviously, uh, the city is the context of the metropolitan area is very, very different to maybe the Midlands, which is still part of the same regional assembly. Um, so there are designated metropolitan areas for those five cities I've mentioned. Uh, there's no specific administrative or governance structures for these uh, metropolitan areas. So Dublin, Galway, Limerick, Cork and Waterford. Um, but I know that there is active discussion on some form of a governance structure for and these metropolitan areas, not necessarily for the assemblies themselves, but certainly for the metropolitan areas. Um, the regional assemblies, they do have a plan making function, but they have no development management function and no formal uh, monitoring function. So they're, you know, I would characterize the regional assemblies as important, but very, very underpowered. And I think there's a lot of work to be done there to, I think, to grow them into meaningful uh, planning um, entities. And the other thing that I think that's notable as well in terms of governance is that there's provision for plebiscites to be held in, in the main cities in Ireland, but to date um, the only new made directly elected mayor uh, is for Limerick. Uh, it hotly debated, as you can imagine, but it's uh, one of the things that's excluded from the mayor's functions are, are planning functions. Not surprisingly, uh, there's a bit of nerves about transferring those, but um, certainly, I think that the feeling in Ireland anyway, and certainly amongst planners, is that they would welcome um, directly elected mayors into the planning system uh, in Ireland. There's certainly been a, a lot of people arguing for that. Next slide. And I hope I'm, I'm, I'm going to keep in time here, uh, Craig. I'm not uh, going over. Um, I'm nearly finished. A couple more slides. So these, these new uh, sub-national or regional planning instruments uh, are the RSESs. So these are the regional spatial and economic strategies. And there's one for each region. And it covers all of the territory of Ireland. So it's not selective in terms of, OK, gather up a few local authorities and do a metropolitan plan or something like that. It does cover all of the territory. Um, and within these, as I've mentioned, there are these metropolitan areas and they have these um, specific metropolitan area spatial plans. Um, so each of the five cities that I've mentioned, these are these larger urban areas and, and they have masks, as they're called, and they spread out over different local authorities in most cases. So the idea there is that there's a more consistent approach to spatial planning in these larger city settlements. And the RSESs and the MASPs coordinate or are supposed to coordinate the statutory development plans for cities, counties and, and local areas. 
Finally, I suppose the point about synchronising plans, um, now city and county plans are going to be undergoing a process where they're going to align in terms of their adoption with the adoption of the national planning framework and the regional spatial and economic strategies. So the problems that were there that we talked about with the NSS, out of sync plans, etc., they're hoping to, to, to avoid that. But that process is, is ongoing at the moment. As you can imagine, six year cycle is the, is the normal cycle for development plans. Next slide, please. Okay, and on delivery, I think this is another important point. Um, a delivery board has been set up for the MPF. I mean, as planners, we've always been criticized, I suppose, about, you know, that's all great. That plan is fantastic, but how are you going to do it? What's your delivery strategy, et cetera? But the, the you know from an early point it was it, it was realised that you know it, it, it has to have some sort of implementation process and it's the, the delivery board was established to do just this and um, I think importantly it's co-chaired by uh, planning and where the money resides and that's the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform that makes the strategic longer term decisions on investment and the national development plan etc. Department of Finance is different, that's kind of like running a current account. The Department of Public Expenditure and Reform is more about fiscal management etc. Uh, over the longer term. So those two um, departments actually uh, meet on a, a, a very regular basis every six weeks to two months and they uh, also meet with their technical advisors so the principal planner and the senior economist uh, will also meet and coordinate um, projects and programs. There's a projects and programs section now. So they're frequent and they're regular. And there's also a revised spending code um, to reflect you know, more balanced uh, decision making, particularly decision making that will reinforce uh, planning objectives, etc. And there's a, interestingly as well, although I haven't tried it, there's a new projects tracker. That's a new open source GIS tracker which shows how the projects are being implemented, where they're being funded, etc., under the, the um, delivery board of Project 2040. Next slide, please. Uh, there's other notable roles that are very influential, I think, as well. We can't forget, um, you know, expenditure in different areas and infrastructure. There are huge issues for planning. And under the Department of Housing Planning, Local Government, Housing, Heritage, sorry, Heritage, Local Government and Housing now, I think it is, or housing, local government and heritage. The name keeps changing every time there's a change of government. But for example, you know, you've got a lot of clout there if you can just pull it together. Irish Water, for example, which is a national uh, infrastructure and utility service for water uh, with a very, very large budget, um, public housing and housing infrastructure budgets, uh, management of the private construction sector. So the construction uh, sector group, I'm on that group myself, um, seeking to kind of get um, looking at procurement issues in the industry, insurances, um, you know, speed of planning processes and things like that. Um, overseeing the regional spatial economic strategies, that's a role in, in the department as well. And monitoring the spatial development patterns that are occurring. So that sort of work is ongoing as well. So importantly, annual reports are still waiting. This report uh, 2018 was published last year. We're still waiting for the 2019 report, but um, these are very useful. Um, I think it forces also openness in terms of the expenditure of, of these public monies as well. And the review I've mentioned of the NDP, there's a new um, programme for government. Um, it is agreed that the re recovery in Ireland from the pandemic is to be investment-led. So the government is to, has, has added another 500 million uh, on top of the programme for government um, into uh, an investment-led uh, recovery. Um, so there's, it's different from the last time when maybe austerity was, was pushed. And this one is more about maybe trying to get counter-cyclical measures uh, moving. So a lot of rebalance there as well. Uh, forced, I think, by the green agenda, you know, um, rebalance of transport spending, walking, public transport, and the town centre first initiative, and and a range of incentives. Next slide. Okay, and just to develop, I suppose I've mentioned these others before. Um, the Land Development Agency. Uh, this agency um, is under construction. It's getting involved in larger. Um, larger developments, in the, particularly in the regional cities, 
And um, we're, I suppose, Craig, it'd be fair to say that in Ireland, planners are, are quite concerned to make sure that this agency works in the interests of sustainable planning and development. And I think there's a concern there that they might end up just looking like a, a, another strategic developer um, and maybe even more aggressive than, than uh, some of them in the private sector. So we're kind of watching that space quite carefully, but um, I suppose sort of hoping that they get wider compulsory purchase powers maybe to unlock some of the problem areas we have where we've got land hoarding and land investment in places where we've made very significant infrastructure investments. The, the OPR I've mentioned, uh, and I've, I've gone through that before, and there was a mention of an urban regeneration development agency, which has probably been replaced by the land development agency, but I think that debate is to be had. We, we do des desperately need more um, uh, guidance, expertise, etc., in the urban regeneration area in particular. Next slide. Okay, general issues um, with the implementation. We've obviously had a problem with construction output. It hasn't recovered, uh, even though you know um, population growth has has occurred. And um, the construction industry was decimated in 2010. Um, it, it just fell off a cliff, and uh, it hasn't. It, it, in no way has it recovered back to what are considered to be sustainable numbers in uh, uh, annual numbers, and um, so not enough development at the right time and in the right places, basically. Um, there's a continued trend to centralization. We know that some of the figures that are being monitored at, monitored at the moment, the city and the commuter belt, they continue to develop. So something, you know, you know, the, the, these other four regional cities, there's going to be a major, major push and a major effort to try and address that. Um, this dispersed settlement in the countryside, which we have in Ireland, is still a problem. 42% of um, homeowners describe themselves as living in one-off houses uh, in Ireland. A staggering, staggering number compared to, you know, what we actually do for a living. Um, so even dealing with that as a legacy is going to be tricky. Um, alignment with local development plans, that still has to be done, but that is a work in progress. So the key challenges, I suppose, that were identified were institutional and governance challenges. Um, this is essentially, I think, one of them is about the role of the regional assemblies. They, that really has to be clarified because so much work is placed at the door of the, of the regional assemblies. Um, leadership is certainly an issue. And you know the monitoring of, of, of other government departments outside of public expenditure and reform is always going to be an issue of the other sectors as well to get the alignment there. There are issues around you know land values and land value capture. That's back on the debate here, but you know that's been a, that's been on the menu since 1973 or 1974. So that's just going to keep coming back up. Um, next, please. And then there's the issue of fiscal and financial issues. And, you know, the market is not in line with what the planners want to do with the country, basically. And there's an issue there of um, incentivizing um, and to address the, the whole idea of viability of development in these other regional centres. And they're being looked at within uh, EU rules, uh, uh, you know, openly available measures, etc. And those funds I was telling you about, they're quite important, but they're catalysts. I mean, sadly, three billion um, over ten years, as or nine years or so. Unfortunately, given the scale of the the problems, it's 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 not quite a drop in the ocean. But you know, it, there need to be a lot more um, private investment and other um, uh, focus of development into these centres if it's going to be if this fund is going to be properly leveraged. So essentially, um, there's going to be, you know, there's a lot of work to be done and maybe not in traditional areas we've, we've thought of as planning, you know, land policy, land management policy, land ownership policy, these things. And we, we see these as being very, very important, targeted infrastructural development and, you know, really trying to um, influence um, the development and, and trying to focus growth. Uh, next, please. So conclusions, considerable change in Ireland. We've learned a lot from the inadequacies of the system over the last 55 years. I think the positive thing about the MPF is that all of the sectors have been brought in and all of the sectors and departments are required, at least on a policy basis, 
to align with the spatial strategies of the NPF. And, you know, there's been a lot of interest in the model, but I suppose Ireland is small, so we have the potential there uh, to try and at least integrate the sectors a little bit better in terms of, of spatial planning objectives, for example, health, tourism, whatever the sector might be. Um, and there's uh, definitely a need to, to really work on the sub-national regional level. Greater governance and planning roles are absolutely inevitable and, and needed. And the, the crunch is really going to come at the local level when all of the aspirations and policies, etc., are going to actually have to be implemented. Uh, and we're going to see, we are going to see a, a bottleneck in Ireland very, very soon um, because of perhaps the lack of, of resourcing and expertise at the local level. Um, and I'm, I'm anticipating that um, um, maybe in the next two to three years in particular. And I suppose what the last point I would make is with everything, um, I suppose the higher a policy framework is, the more, uh, what would you say, influenced by political decision making it is. So I would say that I would categorise planning policy at national and regional, not so much regional, but certainly national level, to be very vulnerable changes of government and, and political uh, changes in political winds okay i think that's it um lisa is there another slide uh no and i've left a few more slides there on the regional side of things but i'm not going to go through them there are uh, a few following slides so i'm sorry about uh, being late folks and i know i haven't left you a lot of time for discussion Connor, can I, can I thank you for that? I hope you can hear the virtual applause ringing around the virtual chamber. Um, that was a really excellent outline of um, uh, the way the system's going. For me, the, the system in Ireland, there's a lot of really chunky, real planning type things in there, which are perhaps not been given that sort of strength in, in other parts of, of the world, in the UK as well. I've got, there's a lot of love going around in the, in the chat I'm getting for this idea of a one government approach. Um, and um, I think that's something which is of interest, I think, to Scotland as well, something the Scottish Government have been trying to do with the national planning framework as well. Um, but there's, some, there's some questions around that as well as to uh, how, how does that um, how does that trickle down? Um, how does how can you ensure, how can you encourage that joined up approach in, in the cities and the regional centres? Um, Danny McKendrick from ADS Architects Design Scotland have been quite keen to ask that question. So uh, is that working or, or is it too early to tell um, or are there, there things we need to do? Uh, I think it's very early at the, at, at the moment. At the national level, certainly in terms of preparation of the document, um, it worked because I think from the outset there was um, an understanding that you, you absolutely needed to bring in all of the other sectors at an early stage and keep the consultation going, as difficult as that might be. Um, so, uh, you know, we had, um, interestingly, we had a minority government um, mm -hmm. up to recently, um, but it was supported by the main opposition party. And the main opposition party did support the national planning framework. So. Uh, well, they didn't vote against it, um, and it went to the cabinet, and it, it 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 went across the cabinet, and it was approved by the cabinet. Some small changes, but by and large, it was it was intact. And what, what, what At the regional say? level, then. Um, okay, no, on you go. Sorry, Craig. So on you go, Connor. Sorry, yeah, no, fire ahead. I'm just going to ask you at, at that national yeah. level. No. Uh, what, what was the state change which actually uh, um, made ministers, politicians actually think that planning was important and there was a need to take up this joined up approach and perhaps use the national planning framework and the national development plan as a truly corporate document? What, 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 made, what, what was the difference that made that happen? That's a good question. <laughs> Very good question, Greg. Uh, um, I, I think, um, in fairness to um, the officials, uh, I have to give a lot of credit to the officials in the department at the time. They worked very, very hard. Um, they became, they grew a team of very, very competent people, mm -hmm. and I mean planners, and they worked really, really hard to get the message across that it wasn't planning that brought on the recession, um, that where, where, where planning was a problem, it was about the deficiencies in planning, 
And there had been talk for a good long time about replacing this national spatial strategy. It was it was um, announced as dead unofficially by the minister, I think, back in 2010. I don't know if you remember that, Craig. Just mm -hmm. uh, off the cuff, um, just said, well, the national spatial strategy just doesn't matter anymore. So. Um, I, I think there was an attitude, um, certainly amongst uh, people, um, to understand that it was deficiencies in planning rather than bad planning. Uh, you know, that, that was the cause of this. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was a willingness, I think, given the state of, of things um, in 2013, 14, etc., to, to, there was certainly a new willingness to, to look, let's, let's try and organize this a little bit better. So I think administratively really got their act together and, and there was a more political openness now to say, look, we've really got to try and organise things a little bit better in the future, you know. Okay, that, that's really useful. Uh, we've got, I'm going to keep going for another five, five minutes or so, overrun a wee bit, but there's some questions coming in. A question from Ewan Leach, uh, Director of Built Environment Forum Scotland, and he's talking about the discussion document recently on the policy for architecture. And it was trying to be strong on um, reconsolidation, reuse of existing cities, towns, villages, and buildings, and, and, and brownfield for, for climate reasons. And he's wondering what, what's the role in there for the national planning framework? Is, is this a, a key means of trying to achieve those ambitions? Yeah, um, like the, the national planning framework um, probably has has a couple of things it, you know actually it's it's worth saying that when the national planning framework was being framed scotland was uh, certainly investigated and and the structure of the national planning framework in scotland was of great interest to the officials certainly so the structure of the national planning framework in ireland is not that uh, different but one of the the key things to it was uh, about more compact uh, one of the key planks, you know, it, it isn't structured around sectors in particular. It's it's structured around sustainable and compact cities, diverse uh, rural communities, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But one one of the things there, uh, one of the important things, is these national strategic national planning objectives, and these are very very important policy objectives that are used by planners at, at, at a variety of different levels. I see them turning up, for example, in planning applications. Um, and they are they, that, that is that that commitment to uh, the built and the natural heritage and to conservation is very much part of that. And um, associated with that, um, we have um, a range of planning guidelines. They're general planning guidelines that are made under Section 28 of the, the legislation, and they cover specifically issues around um, uh, development. You know, they might take their topic based really like retail. Um, uh, there's, there are guidelines uh, that are issued and um, uh, produced by the government policy on architecture. While it's not planning guidance, it's certainly national policy that needs to be uh, considered uh, in framing planning policy and also maybe down to the level of development management. Mm. Okay, that, that's useful. They're not uh, formally part of the planning system, they're not formally part of the planning code. But they are. It is important. I mean, they are, the, the planning. The, there's there's also new policies coming out on placemaking uh, from that area, and there's been very very useful guides. But they're not formally part of what we call the planning guidelines. Right, that, that's useful. I, I'm just going to ask one final question, uh, Connor, and it's about you, you. You mentioned the fact that the um, the the strategic pri strategic priorities will be be reviewed and looked at as part of the post-COVID sort of approach to things. I'm just wondering, are you getting any flavours as to how any review given COVID is going to have, it, have any impact in terms of policy and direction of travel and, and how we shape our, our places? Uh, well, I think it, probably, in, in, Craig, in, in two areas. One, um, uh, I suppose two things came together, COVID and also a programme for government came pretty much at the same time. Um, one one thing that's that's probably became apparent, and I know it's apparent everywhere, was the value of of um, our local, uh, where we live, the places we live, and um, ac local accessibility and quality of place and things like that. 
Um, so one of the big changes I think it, it has it has already happened, and that's a reallocation of funding towards the balance is more uh, towards public transport, uh, cycling, and walking. So I mean I think the strap line was that we will be spending a million euros a day on cycling and 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 walking over the next over the life of the government for the next five years. Um, so there's been a bit of a rebalancing in that area. Um, uh, but you know that doesn't mean that the funding has been uh, withdrawn from maybe road-based projects. Um, so in, in essence, additional funding is being um, put into public transport. And then there's another. Um, these things are being matched then with local permeability, um, local improvements in in town centres. So um, the funding is around maybe in, in improving the pedestrian and um, the cycle infrastructure of of towns, villages, and and, and urban centres. So I think that's a fairly big change. Um, one of the things which we're going to have to grapple with is there's a lot of promises in the around this idea of the town centre first, but it hasn't really been translated back into planning policy and a coherent set of actions. You know, there's talk about incentives and grants and all of this, but I think it's going to take the planners to be able to pull that together into some sort of a coherent um, framework. And um, our argument now, probably with the government, will be that we really need to put the emphasis back on um, good plans and much more plan making. Um, you know, so there too, important money has changed, and there's been that impact. Um, but probably the same in Scotland. People have realised, you know, it really is important what goes on within the, the your two kilometre radius. Um, you know, can you walk through your neighbourhood? Do you have access to a park? Um, all of these things that people may have taken for granted when they were carborn or, or whatever. You know. Yeah, no, that, that's really good because the programme for government in Scotland was published um, at the end of the week and has a commitment to twenty to, to putting in place twenty minute neighbourhoods across Scotland, which is ties into those very concepts which you've talked about. So I'm, I'm going to round things up there. I, I'd just like to say thank you, Connor. There was a hell of a lot in that, and a hell of a lot was incredibly relevant, I think, to how we're taking things forward in Scotland. So it's been really informative, really useful, lots of food for thought in it as well. So, so thanks for taking the time to to pull that together and and, and to join us uh, and, and and sharing your thoughts. I think it's been it's just incredibly useful and informative. So thank you very much. I just like to thank everyone else who's, who's joined. For us. I didn't get through all the questions unfortunately, um, but thanks for coming along. Um, hope you've enjoyed it. This has been videoed, so we should uh, be able to put this on the RTPI YouTube channel fairly soon if you want to revisit it um, or you want to share it with others. Um, I'd just like to say thanks to Scottish Government again for supporting all this work. Um, I'm sure they're finding it incredibly useful as a way to inform how we take forward the fourth national planning framework. And I'd just also like to thank uh, particularly Lisa and Jenny and the RTPI Scotland team for doing all the hard work behind this. Um, so thanks very much. Um, look forward to seeing you all some other time, hopefully in a face-to-face -face setting rather than a, in a screen. Um, but uh, I hope you find that useful and uh, all the very best.